Welcome back to another UFC fight prediction video. In this video, I'll be predicting the prelim fights for UFC Fight Night on ESPN Plus, Thompson versus Pettis. So without further ado, let's get to our first fight on the card and our first fight on the prelim. So in our first fight, we have in the flyweight division, Eric Shelton versus Jordan Espinosa. So in this fight, you got the 5'6 Shelton versus the 5'7 Espinosa. The 28-year-old Shel 28 Shelton versus the 29-year-old Espinosa. So a one-inch height difference and a one-year age difference. Eric Shelton is the much more experienced fighter as far as the UFC level goes. And Espinosa, he's not short on experience either, but he's certainly short on experience at the highest level. So he just this is his debut fight in UFC. He just got a win off the contender series. He actually had two wins on the contender series to get into the UFC. But this is his first fight in the UFC. He's getting a big fight and a big test. So what Jordan Espinosa brings, he's very physically strong. He has a good right power in his right hand. He's pretty fast. So fit, like he's a, got that athletic attribute to him. And he has that power. And he has that size on him. Then Eric Shelton, which you know, he brings, he might not be the biggest guy in the division, but he's very, te he's technically sound. He brings a high pace. He's very fast. And he's very scrambly. He's one of the guys like, he's like a mouse in there. Hard to get a hold on. And hard to like, hard to get a hold of, and even hard to hold down. He's just always moving, always working for something, always scrambling out of something, always moving, always working. And he's been there with some of the best, and he's only really lost to the best prospects in this division. I'm not gonna name them all by name, but he's for you look at his record, you can see that he only lost to the best prospects, and most of them been split decisions over not even just some prospects might have saying they're prospects, like some legit real deal prospects that a lot of people might sleep on or not sleep on, but they definitely should not sleep on the prospects he lost to. And those, I think. Both fights that were split decision, he could they could easily bunt his way. They just didn't go his way. But that being said, let's see how they match up Espinosa versus Shelton. I think Shelton's, I mean, Espinosa's size can be factoring well for him and his wrestling can factor in well for him as Shelton has has struggles with bigger fighters that can impose their size on him. But they're not just bigger fighters, but actually technical technical big fighters are technical bigger fighters than him. I think Espinosa is more technical than him at all. I don't think he is. He might have more power, but technically he doesn't really have it. He can't, like, I mean, as far as imposing that will, he doesn't have the cardio to impose it over three rounds. His cardio is questionable, and his defense is questionable. Like, when he, as his fight goes on, his hands start to drop. He start, His tendencies start to come out. He starts to drop those hands. His mouth starts to come open. He starts to go back, with, straight back with, with his hands down. And you can't really do that in a fight with somebody like Eric Shelton, who's always so fast and so quick, like, like quick twitch, that they can just... I don't know where just bring a kick like a kick up from to your head and like a split second, like a snap of a finger, and the head kick be right on your head if you drop your hands and getting lazy, start leaning over. You get caught with a head kick, you get caught with an overhand, get caught with something. And this fight, I just really think that it's going to be the cardio of Espinosa kind of been the undoing of him. And it's going to be the pace of the pace and tendencies, like lack of pace in the tendencies of Espinosa versus Shelton's experience, his quick twitch, and his pace that's going to beat. Espinosa fight. Espinosa might do good to start, but Shelton's going to start to break him down, secure takedown, start to wear on him once he see him slow down, start to wear on him. And when he sees him with his poor striking defense, he's going to find openings in there and just be a veteran and take advantage of opportunities he see and exploit weaknesses in his opponent. And I don't think he's going to stop Espinosa, but I see a um, pretty clear decision. Um, Espinosa probably win in the first and the second and third, clearly going to Shelton once he starts to drain and outwork the UFC newbie. So in this fight, I have Eric Shelton via decision. Now on to our next fight we have in the Bantamweight division, Ryan McDonald versus Chris Gutierrez. So Ryan McDonald is pretty young, I think 25, 26. Chris Gutierrez, I think is about 28. So both guys still in their 20s. Both guys still got a lot of potential, a lot of time, and a lot to grow and stuff. But when I look at Ryan McDonald, he's coming in with, I think he's he has high hopes and he should. But look at his fights, um, I'm not too impressed. Looking at his record, I'm not too impressed by who he beat, and most definitely not his most two his two most recent wins. I think the last guy he beat was six and five or six and four when he fought him, still um, just about five hundred. Then the guy he fought before then was like six and nine, and now six and ten, something like that. And the guy who was six and nine, six and ten, like his his second to most recent fight, his fight before his fight to get in the UFC that got him in the UFC. He struggled with a guy who was below 500. The guy dropped him at one time, had him in a deep guillotine, mounted guillotine. You're going against a guy who's below 500 and never fought anybody or hasn't beaten anybody. So that doesn't look really too good. But as far as what good, the good things to look at Ryan McDonald is that at least he was able to overcome those tough, tough situations in those fights. He has a good frame. He's 5'11 at Bantamweight. 
So that's real huge for a band and weight. Got a good frame. His striking looks pretty good. Like he has like a good template right now. He's got the size. His striking looks like if he keeps working on it, it could certainly go to the highest level. You know, if he just keeps working on that, it could go to the highest. It's, it's definitely some solid striking. But I'm saying if he just adds on to it, he certainly could strike with the best of them if he keeps improving on his striking. But it's certainly not there yet. I'm just saying he has the potential for it to get there, but it's not there yet because obviously got dropped by a guy who's 6 and like 10 or 6 and 11, something like that. So his striking obviously needs to work on some defense. He works on technique. He needs to work on controlling that range a bit better. Well, really, I just see him as a raw fighter. And you can bet on his potential, but I really don't do that as far as his potential alone. When I look at Chris Gutierrez, I see the more complete fighter. I see him fighting good, like top names, or at least top prospects outside the UFC, doing well against most of them. He's full of some of the best. You know, like When you look at people like Ronnie Barcelos or Barcelos in the UFC, or you look at some of his record, or Gutierrez record, you will see a lot of people that are currently in the UFC. He has wins over a lot of people that are coming up in like the band and and featherweight weight class, you'll see some of those names on the record. Where Ryan McDonald, you don't really see none of those names just yet. And this is his first real test, and he hasn't really had a test yet. And he's already kind of struggled. So against Chris Gutierrez, I think Gutierrez, Gutierrez I mean, I'm stuttering like that, but Gutierrez showed his grappling ability in his fight to get into UFC. He showed his striking. And even that fight against Ronnie Barcelos, where he got submitted, he was actually out striking Ronnie Barcelos, who was no more as a striker. He was out striking him. He wasn't just running through him, but technically he was out striking. He was landing more than him, controlling the pace of that fight and all that stuff. Yeah, he was controlling the pace of the fight on the feet, out striking, out landing Barcelos, who was on, who's on a hot streak right now in the UFC in the UFC right now. So he's on a hot streak, and he was giving him all all the tests he can give him. So he shows his grab and shows strike and he showed at the highest level. And really that's what I'm just going to lean to. I was going to say Chris Gutierrez has shown himself to be proven with Ryan McDonald still seems like he needs some more development. Mike, they should have kept him out of UFC maybe for another year, maybe gave some, put him some tests, maybe made him come through the contender series. I don't think he's ready yet. I didn't think Chris Gutierrez is going to be too much, too experienced, too skilled and too sharp. I think he can beat him everywhere. He can beat him on the ground. He can beat him on the feet. And I think he gets him out of there via a second round TKO. I think he's going to catch him. Ryan McDonald still open over the top. And then catch him like an overhand over one of his, his like weak jabs, drops him, and then finish him with some ground and pound in that second round. So in this fight, I got Chris Gutierrez via second round TKO. TKO. Now to our next fight, we have in the women's strawweight division, Randa Marcos versus Angela Hill. So this fight is probably one of the closest fights on the whole card. It's just because the inconsisten- inconsistency of both women in this fight. We look at both of the records, it's win-lose, win-lose, win-lose. Like as far as just their UFC careers, Angela Hill left the UFC for a little bit because she got cut, I believe. Then went on a winning streak and won the Invicta title. But ever since she came back to UFC, it's been win lose, win lose. And Ryan Marcos never been cut from the UFC. And she's been win lose, win lose, win lose. But in her last fight, they kind of broke the streak, which got a no contest. So we don't know how the pattern's gonna work now that she's got a no contest. So I guess she's it's win lose or at least something else other than losing. So I guess. It kind of broken her curse right now, so she didn't lose in her last fight with a no contest. So maybe she still has the option to lose again. And La Hill is coming off a loss, so she, maybe she still has the option to win or something else other than a loss. So if we're going based off that, then Angela Hill's either going to get a no, it's either going to be a no contest or Angela Hill's going to win just based off patterns. If they follow that, but we're not doing that. But as far as how they match up, Randa Marcos. She just throws overhand, like that ugly overhand, and she goes for takedown. Like, pretty much, she got some pretty poor striking as far as how it looks, but she does is effective with her ugly striking, and she can take you down, and she has good control off top, a good, solid grappler. So that's what she does. She's a, got some ugly striking, but it's, she knows how to use it. Those are overhands and try to get, get get in for those low singles and trip you, like tie your legs and trip you down and try to lay on you and work on you, get some ground to pound. And her ground to pound is not even that effective either. Like, just like a little, just touching you stuff to kind of like she just tagging you, kind of annoying type of stuff. But she is a solid fighter, as you can see. Some of the people she's beating on her resume, even on the the, the ones that aren't on her resume, as far as like the um, Ultimate Fighter win. So she's a solid fighter. But I feel in this fight, the Angel Hill striking is on a much different level. And her, her takedown defense has is much better than it seemed. Like, it seemed like she gets taken down so easily and gets held down, but she actually has about a 70% takedown def- defense ratio. And it's improved a lot since she left the UFC and came back. So when you look at her, her losses in the UFC since she came back, it hasn't been just to somebody who's just been taking her down and landing her. It's like, or taking her out, or with the approach to just try to, you know, grind her out the decision by taking her down and landing her. She's been able to, to do well against takedown, do well in the grappling. And she did 
also beat a champion in the, the championship beating a victor was a grappler. So she's shown that she can deal with grapplers. And Marcus might be on a different level, may or may not be, or around the same level. But I think Angela Hill striking is just on a significant different level. And I think she can at least defend Marcos' takedowns off enough that she can outpoint her on the feet. I don't think she'll be able to finish Marcos, but I do think that she'll be able to outpour Mar- outpoint Marcos. She's a much faster fighter. She's a much more technical striker. Keep it on the feet, outscore her. But I don't think she'll be able to fully load up on a strike. You know, you're dealing with a grappler, so you're not going to be able to plant fully on your strikes. But just enough to tag her, use that movement. Also, Angela Hill's movement been looking good. She does make some poor decisions in fights. But I think this is a fight she can pull out in a very close type of decision. Just outlanding her by a good margin and defending the takedown. So in this fight, I have Angela Hill via decision. Now to our next fight we have in the women's flyweight division, Alexis Davis versus Jennifer Maya. So uh, I was looking at Jennifer Maya at first. I'm like, I'm not impressed. Then I was kind of impressed. Then I'm back to really not being impressed by her. In the Carmouche fight, she did show some good signs that she was like fighting kind of a shooter box type of style, but not really shooter box. Like maybe in some bits it was shooter box, like she high defense guard moving side to side, and then kind of like like was like kind of like a shell defense coming in. But her what she, what she did with it, she kind of just. She has like she was actually out striking in that fight. She actually outstroke Carmouche just based off her having her defense landing, having a decent jab, getting it on the inside, and never it's kind of smothering Carmouche against the cage whenever she was getting off. But Carmouche countered that by just taking her down when she needed to, and just winning the rounds and just like pounding her out on the ground. Once Jennifer Maya had a bit of success on the on the feed and kind of trying to stall her against the cage, but um, that besides the point. Just to get straight to the point, is I think Alexis Davis striking. It's about the same as Jennifer Maya. I'm not saying it's style wise, but as far as skill wise, about the same. In the fight, they both fought Carmouche. Davis actually fought Carmouche twice and beat Carmouche twice. But um, in those fights, you saw Davis. They both supposed to be black belts. Maya's supposed to be a black belt. Davis supposed to be a black belt. But Davis showed much more like ability on the ground against Carmouche. Was able to get reversal, get switches. Got almost got an armbar in like twice, and really, if it was anybody else besides Carmouche, those armbars probably would have been sealed deals because they were in deep. Carmouche just slammed her way out because she's just a physical specimen. But um, yeah, I just think Lex Davis showed much more skill on the ground where Jennifer Maya just kind of just held guard and didn't do much from her back. She kind of got laid on for two minutes here and there, then probably at the end of the round she get up. But Davis showed much more skill on the ground, even though they're about the same height. It seemed like Alexis Davis is taller than Maya, but um. In Carmouche, but um, that's beside the point. But as far as how this fight going to play out, I just feel that Davis' experience is going to show in this fight, and her skills going to show in this fight. They might be both be black belts, might be both be this and that. But Alexis Davis has fought much like the cream of the crop at 135, and now she's fighting the cream of the crop at 125. We look at who she lost to. She's only lost to Ronda Rousey. Well, at least in the past couple years, she lost to Ronda Rousey. She lost to Caitlin Chugeki, and who was right there for a title shot. And just lost by a slim margin to get like to that number one contender fight against another veteran in Jessica I. And uh, I'm forgetting who else she fought. Oh, she lost to Sarah, Sarah McMahon when Sarah McMahon was still like that physical specimen. Sarah McMahon still is a physical specimen style-wise. That can be a bad style. But as far as just for my only, she's all that physically strong. She definitely doesn't have no amazing wrestling. I think Davis is the better grappler. And her style doesn't really bow too well to outpace Davis. She kind of maybe try to wall installer but in this case Davis had a lot of nice little inside trips and from that clinch stage like she Maya can't exploit that as she tried to do against Carmouche because she'll get trip takedown from that angle I think unless Davis can outwork her though a higher pace the better grapplers. so I think overall Alexa Davis is the more experienced the more skilled fighter and she's gonna win because of that and Alexa Davis might be getting up there in the age she might be 35 but 35 is kind of like at the end of your prime or right there so then we kind of get to 36 37 then it starts to dip off so I think Alexa age shouldn't be too much of a factor and they both fought last in July so time is not really a factor age isn't too big a factor and I think more gonna be experience and skill and I think that all those lie in Alexis Davis corner so in this fight I have Alexis Davis via decision now on to our cold prelim headliner we have in the bantamweight division Frankie Sines versus Marlon Vera. So you got the 38-year-old Frankie Sines versus, I believe, the 26-year-old Marlon Vera, like 27-year-old. But pretty much you got like at least 10 years on Vera. So Sines is pretty old. He's getting up there. But he's still a solid fighter. He has a, He's very durable. Got a lot of heart. He's got good conditioning. His striking might not be the best, but he got kind of like that wrestler strike. Like my striking may not be the best, but as far as how I mix all together, you're going to have to worry about it. He got to kind of style. Like he knows his wrestling is solid. His grappling is solid. 
his striking might be always silly, but he can mix it all together and give you some problems. He knows when to throw strikes, and he has good um, feeling for timing and range. And that's what he's good at. But I feel like the age is kind of getting up there, and he won't he won't be able to rely on his recoverability as much as he did in past years. And he has been cracked even in past years, even against um, Uriah Faber and um, I'm forgetting his name right now, but uh, the WEC champion got cracked in that fight. He's been cracked in a lot of fights recently. And um, Marlon Vera is just getting better and better. His grappling is improving. So I don't think Frankie Science can rely on just trying to make a gritty wrestling type of style against him or even getting too aggressive with his style because, I mean, aggressive with his striking. He can't get afford to get sloppy like he did in his other fight because Marlon Vera is very clean with his striking and he'll put a head kick on his head or he'll land it straight on him if he comes in with his hands too low trying to dough hooks or stuff like that. Or even if he comes in too far away with his shots. But I think at this point, like I said, he's Frank, Frank Sines is 38. He's, he's getting up there in age. Malavera is only getting better. And I think at some point or another, it's just Frank Sines' tendency to leave his chin out there. And I think Malavera is going to crack it. Yes, Frank Sines is a good fighter. He has a good shot. But leaving that chin out there against such a much, at this age, against such a young fighter who's only getting better with his skill and striking, it's just not a good recipe for success. I think he's going to get cracked. And I say it's probably going to happen early in the second round. So in this fight, I have Marlon Vera via second round TKO. Now on to our prelim headliner we have in the featherweight division, Bryce Mitchell versus Bobby Moffett. So we have a pretty interesting matchup here in the featherweight division. You got Bobby Moffett coming off a win over Chad Skelly, sunk in that Bravo choke. And whether Chad Skelly was out, wasn't out, or was going to get out, or was too early, or shouldn't have been stopped, the fight was stopping, and it was, is what it is. But it was a nice little choke, nice slick transition. Um, Muffet's patented move. He has like about three Bravo chokes on his record now, at least three on his record right now. So he, very solid with that Bravo choke. And um, got a big win. And then I said it might have been stopped. This might have been this, might have been that. But at the end of the day, the ref stopped the fight. It was a still a nice choke, some nice technique on it. And he did it against a high-level competitor in Chad Skelly. So certainly, certainly that move is legit. It's not just, oh, he did it over some cans outside of UFC. He did it over a solid veteran in Chad Skelly, who was very solid at jiu-jitsu himself and very scrambly, very durable, very hard to put away. But that being said, now we go on to Bryce Mitchell. Bryce Mitchell came off the undefeated season. He um, lost to the eventual winner in Katona, was actually real close to winning that fight, really a couple minutes, a couple seconds, well, a couple seconds away from winning that fight. And then kind of, you know, there's some the fight. He felt the fight was kind of slipping away from him. Like he was winning the round. That third round, they went the third round. He was winning that third round. And then it was kind of transitioning. The fight was kind of slipping away from him. Then he got desperate and gave up his back, and he got choked out. So he was looking good against the best, the guy who wins the one this season, a promising prospect in Katona. And he lost the fight where just one mistake cost him that fight. Then he fought in his debut, the number one pickup team Cormier, and he beat him. He dominated him for the most part in that first and second round without wrestling the D1 wrestler. Out fighting, out striking. He was pretty much beat him everywhere in those first two rounds. Then the third round, he kind of started to slip in that third round. But he had already won the first two rounds pretty clear enough that he was able to get decision over Tyler Dimar, like a split decision or something like that. But he looked good in that fight, and that was against a D1 wrestler. So when I look at him in this fight, you got to worry about, like in his like the Katona fight, he got submitted. You're going against Moffett, who has a very slick guillotine. And then also when you look at the Katona fight, his neck was kind of out there a couple times against Katona. But maybe that's just a style matchup. He doesn't have to worry too much about the guillotine or no Bravo choke or no Darsh choke against Katona as much. I'm not Katona as much, but Diamond as much. As Diamond is just a D1 wrestler. Doesn't really have all that, you know, jitsu like that. His jitsu might be solid, but certainly isn't Katona's level or certainly isn't Moffat level. But that's something to be concerned about. But I'm going to actually lean to Bryce Mitchell in this fight. I feel like his pace... The fact that he showed on the, on the house that he was a good, quick learner. And the fact that he's coming off two fights back-to-back that can mirror this fight. He's going off fights where he's went with good grapplers, solid grapplers. Solid fight, like, like um, Diamond, a solid wrestler. Katona, a solid jiu-jitsu, back-to-back. And he pushed both of them to the edge. He beat T- Diamond and was so close to beating Katona in that last round. I mean, that fight, he won the second round and stuff like that. So it was a very close fight. I feel like Moffat really hasn't been in that that type of fight just yet. He did have a fight like that against um, Kelly, but it was in like push to the limit. He just caught him in the choke, and then it was that. Synced in nights, but he hasn't really been in that that real dog fight recently. And I think Mitchell's going to put him in that dog fight. Him being the younger fighter, man, such a quick learner. I think we're going to see a a much different version of Bryce Mitchell. He's gonna, not going to drop off his pace in that third round. He's going to be able to keep that same energy for the for the whole fight. And they're going to feed. He can. 
He's been showing some nice improvement in his strike, and that's going to factor well in his fight against Moffett. An ability to take down a D1 wrestler not once, but multiple times, that's going to factor in his fight because Moffett was taken down by Skelly a couple times. So I think Mitchell will be able to take down Moffett and get some control there. And knowing that he saw the the Bravo choke being used against Skelly to win that fight, he's going to be he's going to be training for that. So I think he's going to be courting that necessarily, be able to take him down, get some control. And I think the takedown is going to be the tell of this fight. The takedown and control of Mitchell against Moffett is going to be what it wins it for. It's going to be a very close kind of back and forth, gritty fight. A lot of wrestling, a lot of grappling, a lot of transition, a lot of submission attempts. But Mitchell's experience with, you know, two gritty grappling matches back to back going to help him out in this fight and allow him to grind it out to a very close, grindy type of decision. And so in this fight, I have Bryce Mitchell via decision. So that concludes my fight predictions for the prelims of UFC Fight Night on ESPN Plus, Thompson versus Pettis. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe, and come back for more videos. Peace.